Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and welcome to another episode of Turf Talk where again I'm joined by Lawn Solutions National Business Manager, my colleague Simon Adaman. Um, if you haven't heard from Simon before, check out an earlier episode of Turf Talk we did. Simon's had quite the interesting uh, career or journey. Uh, he's done pretty much everything in the turf industry and he's a bit of an industry stalwart. So I'd recommend you you jumping back and, and checking that episode out. But what we're going to focus on today uh, is is the main part of Simon's sort of career, I guess, or where he started is, is, is green keeping, uh, particularly in bowling green. So we're going to talk everything green keeping, everything lawn bowls, and how turf varieties and new technologies have changed over the years in that facet of our industry. So Simon, welcome. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. It's good to be back. So you started out in bowls. Um, again, people can check out the other episode, but just give us a brief overview of how you got into it and sort of where you worked and what you did. Look, Joe, I suppose I started, I left school and didn't really know what I wanted to do. My brother had taken a career in um, green keeping and worked on lawn bowls or on bowling clubs. So I thought it was a good direction. So I started um, late seventies um, as an apprentice uh, green keeper at Balmoral Bowls Club in Brisbane. Those greens in those days when I started were blue cooch greens. So blue cooch was probably a great grass at the time, but very difficult to maintain. It's not one you we really see at all in the industry now, is it? Very little, if any, bowling greens are blue cooch. The reason was you could get a really nice blue cooch green. It'd be great to play bowls on, but very hard to maintain. Disease-wise, and cutting it so low puts grass under a lot of pressure. And you can't spray it or treat it with a lot, can you? Is that the problem? Yeah, yeah. herbicides are very, you know, it's very hard, very selective herbicides to take other grasses out and things like that. So, look, I think back in, I think it was either the late 70s or early 80s, Tiff Dwarf was brought into Australia from the US, and that was probably the big change. Um, so Tiff Dwarf's a, a hybrid green cooch? Hybrid green cooch, very fine leaf, a lot finer than what blue cooch was. Um, I think the methodology or the theory behind that was a finer leaf grass, you can cut lower and you can get better speed. Yeah. So I suppose also just to touch on, um, on bowling greens, different states of Australia, you've got cool and warm season grass. So in Queensland, it was always pre predominantly Queensland blue cooch. New South Wales, it was Greenlees Park cooch. Yep. And then in Victoria, it was bent grass. They st is it still that way now? Look, I think you may be able to find a couple of bent grass greens around in Victoria still. And some of those clubs may be voluntary clubs where the members just look after them. Yeah. Um, but traditionally, right across now would be Tiff Dwarf. Yeah. And that change happened from late 70s, early 80s, right through. That was a big change for the whole of the industry. And we're sort of getting to the point now, we'll touch on this a little bit later on, but Tiff Dwarf's been the dominant bowling green cultivar for, like you said, a couple of decades now. Um, there's some technology changing where, where this may not be the case for a lot longer. I think there's, we're getting to that point now, that which you spoke about before, where they went from blue cooch or bank grass to green cooch. We could be potentially in the area now of going into from green cooch to something else. An, into another change period. And so just with just so people know with Tiff Dwarf, the cultivar Simon mentioned before, you obviously know that there's a grass out there now, Tiff Tough. There's also Tiff Grand, Tiff Eagle. They're all part of the Tiff family. Uh, Tiff is short for Tifton, which is a place in Georgia where the University of Georgia breed all their turf grasses. So they all come out of the same program. So, so you said, what was that, late 70s, early 80s, late that 70s, change came? Early 80s. And look, from memory, I think the first bowling club in Australia to put Tiff Dwarf in was a guy called Roy Holbert from Byron Bay Bowls Club. Right. And I could be wrong, but I'm, 100%, I'm nearly 100% sure it was him. He brought it in from the US, and that's how it all started. Um, Tiff Dwarf is a fantastic grass for a bowling club or for a bowling green. When you consider you're mowing something at two mils, it's getting rolled, it's getting walked on compaction. There's a lot of um, things that you shouldn't be doing to a grass that you are doing to it. Yeah. Um, it's not a bulletproof grass. It does get some disease. And as it's sort of gone on over the time, it gets spring dead spot, some ERI, things like that. So it's got to be treated. Probably... Traditionally, when I started and we started working with Tiff Dwarf, um, every year we'd renovate. So we'd take it right back to dirt. Um, 
air rate or drill, as we used to say, you'd have a drilling machine that would put three, eight drills and bring the dirt out, things, things like that. So we'd do that every year in spring, top dress or level to get your levels right. Once upon a time when we were leveling, we used to use wires. That was really sort of showing your age now. So what you used to do is you'd get wires and they'd be on a ratchet at each end. Right. And you'd tighten them and then you'd get a water level and you'd go and you'd chock all the wires and then you'd run a screen along the wires and that's how you would get your levels. So this was before the laser level days and things like that. Then we went from the next point, we went from using wires to rails where you'd have a steel 25 mil block steel, mm. same setup, you'd set it all up and then you'd go and take all your levels with a water level and chock it all up and then you'd have a screen that sits over the top and you'd drag it along and you'd do, a, you'd do half a rink at a time. So you'd do half, move the next one over, set the levels and just move it. Sounds them. like a slow labour oh, intensive it was, process. It was hard and you could imagine if your green was out of level, you know, you, you could be putting up to 25 mil yeah. places and then trying to get that through was really difficult. Would you you got it got it to the green with a horse and cart or <laughs> no you should ride on mower and, <laughs> ride on mower and trailer no, right. or wheelbarrows so um, and you'd hand you know you'd hand spread it. So it was a very strenuous labor sort of intensive. So, so let's let's dive into that a little bit more now because green keeping as a general industry is a very particular industry. You've got to be pretty well onto everything to get it perfect. But I guess bowling bowling rinks bowling greens go that next level up compared to golf because it's got to be cut that little bit shorter it's got to be kept absolutely inch perfect so like for example mowing so you said you cut it two mil or thereabouts on a bowling and how many times a week are you mowing to keep that consistent particularly in summer with a warm season grass so back to the cutting height it's an interesting one um i suppose it's a bit of an industry sort of saying but we used to cut the lowest we would go is a thickness of a five cent piece when a five cent piece was yeah, around. Right. So that was the lowest. We would then traditionally cut around the thickness of a 10 cent piece. Yeah. And some people would, if you wanted to bring a little bit more grass on and slow them up a little bit, you'd lift your mower to a 20 cent piece. So we're talking two mil so maybe. This, yeah. yeah. So that was probably the cutting, the cutting scenario. In summer... If you brought a green back from renovation, it was nothing to double or triple cut that green seven days a week. Every day. Every day. Yeah. Um, I can still remember getting on a mower. Traditionally, it'd take 45 minutes to cut a green. I'd cut it four times really? in one day, just different angles, bringing it back into play. The more you cut it, the quicker it's going to tighten up. You don't want this growth, you yep. want that growth. So the yep. more you keep cutting it, the tighter it's going to get. Same principle applies in any lawn, really, doesn't it? Any lawn, mm -hmm. same. You then get a roller on it and roll and roll. Mm -hmm. So the soil you'd use or the sand you'd use is normally probably an 80-20 yeah. sand, soil sand mix because um, you need something that's got some comp clay to get compaction, yeah. to get speed. I thought you'd use heavier soil closer to a wicket soil. No, because then it won't drain, it'll stay wet. Yeah, okay. So yeah. You'd, you'd need a, you know, some clay to get compaction. If you didn't put clay in it or get that mix, yeah. what would happen is your sand or particles wouldn't bind together right. and your surface would always be loose and moving. Yeah, you don't get that and firm then, And then you don't get yeah. that speed from yeah. it. So yeah. it... It's, that's a pretty specialist thing, getting the right soil, because mm -hmm. that can bring you undone for the next season or bowls. Yeah. You can never get any pace. Um, putting the grass at that height and mowing, it puts it under stress. So mm -hmm. the first thing is, as soon as you get some hot days and it dries out, it starts to slow, show signs of dry, dry patch. Yeah. So wetting agents were a massive part of maintaining a bowling. Were they game. always a factor or were they something that got introduced along the way for you somewhere? Probably got introduced along the way. Yeah. Um, and there's some really good surfactants and wetting agents out there now that make a make a big difference. Through all this period, it has been innovative. When we used to first um, irrigate bowling greens, it was with aluminium pipes, mm. set them up. It, and it depends on water pressure. You would move half across to the other and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Then probably in the 80s, 90s, went across the Toro automatic irrigation systems with tanks and things, which, which really changed the industry. So are they, do they use pop-ups now on yeah. bowling greens? Um, not in the greens. Or they're only on the, on yeah, the corners. The corners and, yeah. and they'll shoot. Well, a bowling green's 38 metres by 38. We used to work on 1,600 square metres. Yeah. 
So those irrigation from the four corners, oh, there's actually um, corner, middle, corner. Yeah, right. So the corner ones would shoot 30 metres. Yeah. And j- just while we're talking about it, a little segue, is you, you touched on wetting agents before and, and the importance of them. I think um, as we're heading into summer of you know, 23, 24, it's meant to be a, a pretty hot and dry one. So wetting agents, whilst they're used readily on bowling greens and in sports turf, there's something the homeowner should consider as well, do you think? Oh, look, 100%. It's, it's, once your soil profile gets hydrophobic, water will just sit on the top. So you can water and water, and the first thing or the easiest way for water to get through your profile is to find a crack and it'll run through a crack. Yeah. If they're hydrophobic, as soon as you put a wetting agent on, it'll allow that water to penetrate through the profile. And that's all through chemical imba- you know, chemical balance when you have negative and um, positive charge cations and ions that attach to the soil particles that allow water to attach to them and run through the profile. So people use a wetting agent and then just stick to a regular irrigation regime? Is that sort of what they should do? This is what I used to do. There's two types of wetting agents. There's a surfactant that will bind to the soil and, and, and stay there, and then there's a soil penetrant. Mm. So if you get hydrophobic soil, what I used to do was use a soil penetrant, yep. which would straight away allow the water to go through the profile mm-hmm. but wouldn't hold it in the profile. Right. Then you would back it up with a surfactant that would then bind to the soil particles and allow that to, water to stay in the soil profile right. for four to six weeks. So penetrant first if you're having for issues. And, first, then you and then you go to a surfactant that would yeah. bind. Yeah, right. Um, so that was a big part of it. Disease was another big part of it. After rain, I think the most common disease you'd get in a bowling green because of the height again would be some um, helmo. Yep or a little bit of white helmo and black helmo. Mm-hmm. So white helmo is just like the size of a, of a golf ball, yep. spots everywhere, and then you get the black helmo. Um, so we would probably use a preventative and a curative fungicide program to keep them, to keep them clean, and then more so preventative for things like spring dead spot, ERI and that that would come in in, in the cool because months. of the pressure you're putting at turf because under you put the pressure and the same rule applies just for homeowners as well the the shorter you cut your lawn the better it's going to look but the more susceptible it is to things like disease isn't things it? Like yeah that. yeah so that's why a preventative fungicide program is pretty crucial um, we didn't we didn't have the luxury of having the products that are available now in yeah. the early early times. We used some products that were pretty toxic, S7s that are now being taken off the market. Yeah. They, bloody hell, they worked unreal, but they weren't safe to use. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I used a product, I won't tell you what it was, but it was a mercury-based fungicide, and I got a little bit on my arm, and I washed it off straight away and woke up the next morning, my whole arm was just a big blister. <laughs> Is this so, why you, you twitch a little bit yeah, now? Yeah, probably hey? like that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so those chemicals were yeah. were really toxic and they've been taken away and now there's new chemicals on the so market. The, so the big change, as I understand it, is less active required to get a similar yes. result and just safer. Like look at look at insecticides, for example. Like I know uh, pests and in, insects would have been a problem in, in bowling exactly. greens back in the day and the products you're using back then compared to, say, a celebra now in terms of safety, your chalk and cheese. Oh, biggest issue... Look, you would get some black beetles now and then, but where you would get them would be if you played bowls at night and you would have lights. Yeah. The black beetles would fly to the lights. The right. light would attract them. Yeah. So you'd come in in the morning and there'd be dirt mounds everywhere where they've flown in and tried to burrow down into the green. Yeah, okay. Where traditionally now they're coming the other way. Yeah. So that was one issue. The other big issue we had is mealybug. Okay. Okay. Mealy bug was a big, big issue. The white, little white mealy bug yeah. living on the plant. We hear about them in the US when we go over there every time. Yeah. It, was, it, was a, it was a real problem. Yeah. Um, and that was one thing. Did, did you have preventative insecticide options back then or is that something well, that's yeah, come Yeah, we in? did. And the products that are no longer available, but what we would do at a renovation, you would scarify, you would drill, open up the green, and there's two things you would always do before you top dress. You'd put... Um, a preventative fungicide on in those days, mm-hmm. which was called Chloroturf, and it was a soil-based fungicide that you put in, wash it in, and get down the holes for the roots. That was that worked unreal. Yeah. Then there was another thing we used to use, and you've probably heard of it, Nemocur. 
for yep. nematodes. Mm -hmm. So bowling greens, again, because they're cut low, would be under stress and a lot of them would get some nematodes in them. Yeah. So every year we'd put on a preventative um, application of Nemocur for nematodes and that would be... So they're the two things you would do at renovation time. Nemocur for nematodes and Chloroturf for disease. And did you have to... You would have had to renovate every year or...? Yes and no, based on the amount of play. Yeah. And then probably based on the drainage in the green and things like that. Mm. If you had a green that didn't drain real well, it'd stay wet, it'd get some thin patches. We, we over the period, sometimes didn't renovate all the greens every year. Yeah. We would keep it in play. We would drill it and give it a light groom mm. and a bit of a feed, but keep it in play. And so... You have to use grooming reels and, and proper scarifiers for a shortcut grass like that to get thatch out of it. Yeah, you? you've got to remove, you've got to get, to get speed on a bowling green, you need leaf, yeah. not thatch. Yeah. So you're, you're really on a fine line between taking too much grass out mm. and opening the surface up and having too much there. Because thatch is spongy, the, yeah. the, the ball will slow down. Yeah. So it was a real fine art. It's a balance, isn't it? Yeah. Groomers were interesting. They would now you've got mowers that have grooming reels prior to the to the cylinder. Yep. In those days, we would take the cylinder out of the mower and put a grooming reel in the mower mm -hmm. and then go and groom. Do you catch your clippings? Yes, always, always. Yeah, catch clippings, catch all the grooming. Yeah. So um, it was a real fine art and balance to maintain a surface. One thing we haven't touched on is fertiliser. That was, that's probably a really interesting one is getting onto a fertiliser program. Always at renovation, it was a granular yep. fertiliser. Back in the 80s when slow release wasn't really around too much. So we used to do, I'd mix my own blend and it'd be um, UF38 nitrogen with potash and phosphorus and all things. So mix up my own, mm -hmm. just shovel it on the side, mix it all up. Oh, actually mix it yourself Mix on it side. all up, just buy all the bags, mix it all in. Yeah. And then you would then put it on through in the early days. Then you'd go and mix probably eight or ten barrels of sand with that fertiliser. And then you would actually put it on with a drop spreader, not a not a rotary spreader. Well, like top dress. And yeah, and you'd put it on and it'd just drop out over the green, so you do all the green, and then you get a mat and pull it around and rub it into all the holes. Right. And that's that's how you... And, and then, do, they, do they use normal sort of spreaders now? Now it's now a because of the technology yeah. of, of fertilisers, slow release and things, it's all rotary spreaders now yeah. where you can just go and put it on. And prill size would be pretty crucial in greens. Yeah, you got um, yeah. The SGN is a lot lot smaller than what a traditional homeowner. I yeah. think a homeowner's size of the prill or the SGN might be three hundred. Yeah. On a bowling green, you'd be back to ninety to a hundred. Yeah, SGN, right. Very really small prill. Yeah. And it would be probably now methylene urea, which would dissolve straight away and not poly coated, where it'd stay around on the surface. Yeah. So that, that side of it's changed massively. So it was, it's very labour intensive and in the early days it was great. But now it's, it's changing. Clubs are probably putting more pressure on green keepers, more play, things like that. So I don't know, the future, obviously I think the future is probably Tiff Dwarf has been around. I think there is going to be some better options come to the market. Let, let, let's talk about that a little bit now because I know – particularly in the golf world, not not so much in Australia or to a point in Australia, but mainly in the US and in Asia, there's been a big shift towards soysy grass across golf, mainly for the reasons you mentioned before, you're cutting seven days a week, they're cutting golf greens two, three, four, five days a week. Zoysia grass, fairways, greens, they're halving that in a lot of ways because of how slow growing it is. Do you think zoysia grass will eventually make an impact in the bowling industry or, or not? I think it's... A I think it's the future. It's changing people's culture is going to be the hardest. Who's going to be the first person to put it in? Who's going to see the benefits? You and I are fortunate enough to probably travel the world and see what these new grasses are capable of. Yeah. Um, the zoysia today is probably a finer leaf than tiff dwarf. Yes. Um, it le needs less nitrogen or nutrient. It's less disease. Um, it's it's it doesn't get as much disease. That, that, that's a that's a big one. Sorry, right? That's that's a big one, isn't it? From what we've seen, is disease resistance. When we look at we go to Asia, for example, and we see grasses like L1F or Trinity zoysia, Stadium zoysia, Prism zoysia, 
compared to, say, a TIF Eagle, the big difference is disease resistance, isn't it? Massive. And, and the cost saving. One guy um, has bit the bullet at Broom's Head Bowling Club on the north coast of New South Wales. And he, he had a, he's got two greens. One's Tiff Dwarf, gets a lot of disease. The other one is pretty close to the, the river that runs behind the back of the club and the water table comes up a fair bit. So you get a heap of rain that comes right up underneath. And he had a fair bit of issues. That green is more used for barefoot bowls. So what, what they did, the club agreed, they took one full rink out and put Zoysia in as a trial. Right. This is the first one? First one. And... Um, you talk to Blair now, and he can't praise it enough. It it holds its colour through winter, where where Tiff Dwarf will lose colour through winter and go quite dormant. Yeah, it will hold its colour. He hasn't put a insecticide on it in three years. Yeah, I think he's put one or two fungicides on because there was a little bit of rust sometime. But it's it's worked perfectly for what what they want, and they're going to now expand that across the whole green. And the, the, these are specialties always, aren't they? So a lot of people will be familiar with matrellas such as Sir Grange, but these are even finer and more short, you know, more able to tolerate shortcut than Sir they're Grange, designed, aren't they? They're designed for greens. Yeah. yeah. For low-cut yeah. greens. What I think the biggest thing also with, with the zoysias is you can have, right around Australia, we can have wet weather and we can have some long periods of cloud with wet weather. Yeah. And things will stay wet and then you get a lack of sun and the grass will start turning a bit yellow and things like that. That, I believe, is probably one of the advantages for zoysia. It comes from Asia where there's a lot of cloud cover, there's a lot of humidity, there's a lot of things like that. So I think we haven't even looked into that side of zoysia yeah. where it can really fit. If I was to go back green keeping... Tomorrow, and what I know now, I would have no hesitation in putting Primo Zoysia onto a bowling green. Um, what's the disadvantages? It all sounds great, but nothing's always perfect. What would be the disadvantages of putting Primo on? I think probably the growing period. Yeah. If I pick the right time to plant a bowling green when we got some humidity, good heat, bit of rain, I could grow in a bowling green with Tiff Dwarf from planting to the day they play on it in eight weeks. Okay. Best I ever did yeah. was six weeks and one day. It's from really the fast. day it was planted yeah. to the day we played on it. Yeah. Was it perfect? No, but it was fine to play. Yeah. But I think you could do it in eight weeks. Yeah. I think Primo Zoysia, you could probably do it in 12 or 13 weeks. Good conditions you could, yeah. Good conditions, no problems. Once you get past that side of it, I don't see any disadvantages, only positives. That, that's the thing with zoysia grass in general, though. It's short-term pain for long-term gain, that's, isn't it? And that's yeah. the hard thing we've got to get over the hill with. I, I agree with you. That from, from what I've seen, I think across all facets of industry, there will be a time in the future where zoysia is the dominant cultivar across all industries, from what we've seen in terms of research. If people listen to our, our research podcast, you'll hear us delve into that a little bit further. There's just so much work getting done on zoysia grass. It's going to be the future whether we like it or not. Um, it just will be. And I think bowling greens are a place where it's going to offer real benefit. Um, and these grasses, these zoysia grasses, like Primo zoysia you mentioned before, Trinity, a few others, they're going to be putting bowling greens and putting greens, but they won't be as suitable for home lawns because they're so short and so fine. You'll get thatch issues. Um, you'll get management issues because they're not mowing it mm. twice a week in home lawns. So it'll be a they a need problem. They need working. When I say working, you don't have to be on it all day, every day. But if you want to get it really low and, and, and have speed in it, they've got to be groomed. They've got to be mowed. You've got to use a cylinder mower on them, yeah. all of those types of things. The more you can groom and mow on any grass, but the better it's going to get. And with just with bowling greens, mentioned um, just re-turfing and changing species before, you never instant turf a bowling green, do you? They're, are they always sprig planted? Always sprig planted. And how often would you do it? Through my green keeping life, I probably planted a green and probably after about eight years, you would get a turf cutter and cut the top off yeah, and then re-level it and replant it. Yeah. There's a period of time that that real coarse thatch 
gets under the surface that you can't just get rid yeah. of. So you can do it. There was different theories, and I've seen so many different things that happen. There was a machine that was designed once, and it was a burning machine. So it actually had gas bottles on it, and it had flames coming out of it underneath, like a barbecue, and you push that across a bowling green, and it actually burnt it and burnt all the thatch. Yeah, right. So it was quite interesting. So you do it all, burn it all, then you'd run the scarifier net through, and you'd mo- remove all the dead, burnt-out stuff. Yeah. That, that was successful to a period of time. Yeah. Um, then you would use another machine, a shaving machine. I suppose it was similar to a top maker. Yeah, so I was going to go shaving. And yeah. you would have a shaving machine and it would shave the surface off. Yeah. But you would still leave your roots and rhizomes there. And you wouldn't have to re-turf if you just shaved a lot of the time with these cooch grasses. Would yeah. You? yeah. There's a lot of different things. There's a lot of different apparatus that people don't realise. There was another machine, a slitting machine, that, that was on the back of a tractor and it had mm. blades that would go down that far. So if you had some issues with drainage or something, you would then put that on at renovation and they'd just slit, slit, slit the, the green oh, and okay. open it up and allow water to go through it. Similar to what they use on a farm now in some instances? Sim- isn't similar it? like that. Yeah. So um, all bowling greens, when I say all, the majority of bowling greens would have been specifically, specifically built with a drainage system in mm-hmm. them. I was fortunate enough when I worked at Cleveland Bowls Club in southeast Queensland, two of the greens there, because it's it's called the Redlands, it's very farming, it was a it's it's perfect soil. Yeah. It's a red sandy soil. We built two greens without any drainage whatsoever. Because and of the quality of the soil. Because of the quality and they were the best two greens that I'd ever worked on in my life. Yeah. The water would just run through them. Yeah. Um, we were right on the coast, we had a creek next to us but the drainage was phenomenal. Um, would, would you say bowling green construct, construction is a similar process to golf green construction? Is it USGA sand? Is it me- it's a, it's metal drainage? Yeah. It's specialty. You would start from a base. You'd put your drains in, so you have your laterals running across the green. Then you'd have a header pipe, mm. all of that. Your ditches would have drains in, so they're all connected. Yeah. Then you, you build up with gravel and up, up to the top, and then you would put concrete ditches Mm-hmm. formed up around, around the edge yeah so i was fortunate enough to come through an era where bowls was very popular bowling clubs were very financial mm-hmm. so and there was a lot of very experienced green keepers around so i i was probably lucky when i started to be the youngest in that field but there was a lot of experienced people around that could could assist and there were strong associations and strong networking that now's not there. Because I, I know you're still obviously involved with your job now, involved with grass, and that rolls over into green keeping and bowling clubs and that sort of thing. You still mow a couple of bowling greens every now and again. Yeah, I've got, got, so. got a mate that I used to work with and sometimes he gets stuck and, and um, he'll give me a ring. And I actually really enjoy it. Mm. Would I do it full time? No, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. But I actually enjoy going up there some mornings at six o'clock and get on a mower and cut the green and roll it. Because um, whilst a lot of things change, some the core of it still stays the same, doesn't it's it? It's like riding a push bike. Yeah. I hadn't mowed a green for 20 years and then you go and start a mower and you mow it and, yeah. and away you go. Yeah. So um, over the period of time, there were some key people. There was one guy, well, there was actually probably three people in my life that I sort of probably mentored me and I listened to was obviously my brother started before me. Yeah. Um, there was another guy that's just retired and spent his whole life, 50 years in turf, a guy called Rob Green. Right. So when I, he was the first guy I worked for when I got into green keeping. Then I left and he left green keeping, got into chemical sales. Mm-hmm. And then he used to come and service me and, yeah, right, and yeah. I'd buy thing, uh, chemicals and fertilizer off him. And then after that, when I got out of green keeping, he was actually my boss when I went and worked selling chemicals. Yeah. And then as things turned, probably five years later, I was his boss. Um, and then 11 years ago, I came to Lawn Solutions. So he's been in the industry for 50 years of his life. Yeah. And he's just retired. And the other guy was a guy called Dennis Marnie. So when I started, Dennis was a, a greenkeeper in Brisbane and a very experienced guy and was always willing to help people. Yeah. And that was one thing about the industry. When you're a greenkeeper and you're involved in that industry, people are always willing to help. You've only got to ask. That, that, that's across the board in turf, I feel. It's, like Whether yeah. it's golf, whether it's bowls, whether it's farming itself, we're pretty lucky in our industry that there's always someone willing to help. People love it. They, yeah. they offer advice. 
They'll go out of their road to help. And networking within the industry, as much as sometimes people think it's a junket, and yeah, it probably is, but I think it's pretty critical to to have those connections in the industry yeah. and be involved in the industry because you never know when you need them. Yeah. And you've got plenty of them. Whenever we go anywhere, people just flock to Simon and Simon seems to know everyone. He leaves us all sitting by ourselves twiddling our thumbs in the corner. But um, it's a, it's obviously credit to you. You've got a lot of respect in the industry. You've been doing this for a very, very long time. Some of the methods you described before sound quite prehistoric, so that's pretty evident there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but um, it's a good chat. Um, it's always good to have Simon on the podcast. Simon's got so much knowledge um, and he's an integral member of the Launch Solutions team and it's part of the knowledge you can tap into uh, by talking to Launch Solutions, uh, whether it be for your home lawn, for a job, anything like that. We're, we're here to help and there's people like Simon who can offer such expert advice. But um, it was an interesting chat. Uh, it's nice to delve into something we don't normally talk about, which is the bowling green. Yeah, something industry. different, isn't it? Yeah, it was cool. But um Thanks for, thanks for coming on again. I'm sure we'll, we'll have you on again soon and we'll be talking about something else. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thanks, Cheers. Tom.